Hello, everyone. My name is Piper Doherty with Seattle Arts and Lectures. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us here this evening as we honor three books from authors who are deeply embedded in Sal and in Seattle's greater literary community, whose generosity of spirit and grace continue to make waves among us. I have the distinct honor to recognize Corinne Manning, Kristen Miatis Young, and E.J. Ko, whose books have been long awaited and came into this world amidst a global pandemic. Corinne Manning teaches in Seattle Arts and Lectures Writers in the Schools program at the Center School. Kristen Miatis Young moderated Sal's events this year with both Luis Alberto Urea and Carmen Maria Mercado. EJ Co. will moderate our event with Minjin Lee on June 15th. All local and all dedicated to literary kinship, Corinne, Kristen, and EJ met each other while they were still writing these books, and they connected over publishing worries and woes, asking how it is to be in the literary world as debut and evolving writers. It feels so special that each found a home for their books with small presses in the West. EJ with Tin House in Portland, Kristen with Red Hen Press in LA, and Corinne with Arsenal Pulp Press in Vancouver. We are honored here at Seattle Arts and Lectures to play a small part in their journeys. Before we begin, I also want to thank our incredible co-presenters of tonight's event. The Richard Hugo House has remained an incredible leader in our community among so many unknowns, and tonight they remain by our side. We certainly wish we could be in the Lapis Theater, tipping the wonderful bartenders, enjoying words from Tree Swenson or Rob Arnold. But for now, thank you to Hugo House for helping us and for promoting this event, as well as for remaining continuous supporters for artists and writers. Thank you also to Elliott Bay Book Company for providing books from all our authors tonight. You can find the direct link for every book on both our Facebook event and Seattle Arts and Lectures event page. It's an incredibly tough time for booksellers, but we know with the support of Seattle's literary community and the continuous hard work of everyone at Elliott Bay, we'll come out of this together. I encourage you to order these books right away. Tonight, we will hear from three authors who deeply consider the stories we tell ourselves and the stories we tell others. Authors who carefully reveal the complicity involved in any story, in any power dynamic, and in any relationship. These authors show up for their communities in consistently powerful ways and keep buoyant amidst these incredible times. After a brief reading from each writer, they will be joined by renowned writer Paul Lasicki, who will host a conversation about literary community and how the gifts we offer as writers can be transformed. We invite you to also stick around for an open Q&A between audience and our writers tonight, which you can drop in the comments as soon as that portion of our evening begins. So without further pause, I'll begin with introducing our first reader. E.J. Ko is the author of the memoir, The Magical Language of Others, and the poetry collection, A Lesser Love, and the winner of the Pleiades Press Editor's Prize for Poetry. Her poems, translations, and stories have appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Slate, World Literature Today, and elsewhere. She has accepted fellowships from the American Literary Translators Association, Kundeman, the McDowell Col Colony, and others. Co earned her MFA at Columbia University in New York for creative writing and literary translation. She is completing her PhD in English language and literature at the University of Washington in Seattle and was recently named Prairie Schooner's Virginia Faulkner Award for Excellence in Writing. Co's book, The Magical Language of Others, is a lyrical memoir on the translation of familiar, familial love across time, space, growth, and oceans. It deeply examines silence, what we carry, be that culture, family, or individually, and is a testament of what it takes to unbury both ancestral trauma and story. It delights in language and examines cross-cultural existence, hovering between grief and joy. Ko carefully and slowly peels back the layers of what it meant for her to have a mother, but also ask questions about mothering as an act, a verb, a state of being, 
end as an inherent loss. Lately, EJ has been writing love letters to strangers and just sent number 141. And if anyone wants that one, they can find instructions on her website. Tonight, EJ will read an excerpt from The Magical Language of Others, as well as from her essay, Writing Advice from My, from my Younger Self, which was published on Catapult. She says that she's currently reading DMZ Colony by Don Mi Choi, the Seattle poet and translator. And if she were to choose a flower that represents her, EJ says she used to have a parakeet that loved to bathe in baby's breath, and that the Korean national flower, the Rose of Sharon, is also part of her. Please help me give a warm welcome from afar to EJ Cup. I have to switch this up right here. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for your introduction. I find that the longer the introduction, the more nervous I get because of the rising momentum. It needs to be shorter for me, or that's my fault. So, um, such an honor to be here to celebrate Brynn and also read with Kristen and talk to Paul and all of you guys. It, it's I'm glad to be here, so thank you. And I'm gonna read just a, this short passage. It's in, the, the memoir has a lot about me and my mother, but I, this is the chapter where um, it's my grandmother, Kumiko, her relationship with her mother. Um, I get to explore that um, in the event of the Jeju Island massacre, where um, my, my, grand, my great grandfather, so my grandmother's father was, um, he was stoned to death in the massacre. And so what happened was that my grandmother blamed her mother for that stone because he went out to sort of rally people to. And this comes at the end of that chapter. So I'm sorry if it kind of spoils the chapter. But... Despite her longing, Kumiko chose to rest in California. Her grave was cleared of weeds pulled by the workers she had greeted herself the previous year. Maybe she wanted to be close to her family, buried in the country chosen by her children. As I learned Japanese, roamed through Ueno and the elevator of that ryokan, I learned to isolate myself through language, from English, to Korean, to Japanese. It was so effective, it was frightening, as if I could guard against others like a spy. Where I could hardly open my mouth before, it now seemed that no one could speak to me. Languages as they open you can also allow you to close. When I felt myself running towards seclusion, I heard my grandmother and my great grandfather urging me to try and how much harder one must try when learning to love. She never asked me to speak but to understand rather than endure to forgive and never to sacrifice only to let go. And I'm just going to read the, the last section of this recent essay. And it's called Writing Advice from My Younger Self. And I, I'm really grateful to Catapult for giving me the opportunity to sort of contemplate and think about what, what are the sort of, what, what's behind my decisions and choices? And what are sort of my values in terms of my writing? And getting a chance to reflect on that is meaningful. So it's the last section. Six. Perhaps it took me longer than others to nourish a sense of value in my own life. In my youth, I regularly attempted to take my life. The verb live bothered me in its action, which opposed my inaction. However, the noun life suggested that whether I chose to live or not, I was life. 
the verb hindrance, the noun, the place of calm neutrality, rather than living to sacrifice and overcome, life became a thing to observe and contemplate. If there was value in any life on earth, then value must be present in me. If I believed in this one thing, I could write freely. I learned to know my life as valuable. Whatever I wrote was a natural occurrence of life. I trusted that each day was building up to say something to me, and me to the world. There was no such thing as alone. I practiced joy and ease the way I practiced my writing. This freed me to imagination, sincerity, and compassion. Thank you so much, EJ. That was wonderful. Next, I will be introducing Kristen Miatis Young. Kristen is the author of Subduction, named a staff pick by the Paris Review and called Whip Smart by the Washington Post. A prize winning journalist and essayist, Kristen serves as prose writer in residence at Hugo House. Her reviews, essays, and investigations appear in the Washington Post, The Guardian, and the anthologies Latina Outsiders, Remaking Latina Identity, and Pie and Whiskey, a New York Times new and notable book. She was the researcher for the New York Times team that produced the investigative series Snowfall, which won a Pulitzer Prize. From 2016 to 2019, she served as board chair of Investigate West, a nonprofit newsroom she co-founded to protect vulnerable peoples and places of the Pacific Northwest. Subduction, a gripping, saturated, and lyrical debut novel, follows Claudia, a Latina anthropologist to the Macaw Reservation in Nia Bay on Washington's outer coast. Ultimately, this is a novel of encounter between Claudia and Peter, her main subject of investigation's son. But this is also a novel of encounter between diaspora and indigenous communities, between histories of dominance and resistance, between the stories we tell ourselves to survive. Anyone who knows Kristen knows that her mentorship and deep dedication to literary leadership and stewardship leave trails of generosity behind her. The Hugo House Fellows that she mentors call Kristen an advocate for all, an example of fierceness, humility, and grace, and say that she is a fierce reminder to stand up for your work and for what you believe in. Lately, Chris has, Kristen has been finding solace in birdsong, children's laughter, and books, and she's currently reading Yuri Herrera's A Silent Fury. If Kristen were a flower, she'd be a cross between a Western trillium, which heralds spring, and a mariposa, the national flower of Cuba. Please help me give a warm welcome from afar to Kristen Miades Young. Hello. Hi. Um, I just want to say first that first reading is absolutely what I needed to hear today, and I think every day of this pandemic to remind myself that being open to sincerity means giving yourself time to savor the joys that are available. So thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, we're going to take a very large tonal shift right now because Corinne asked me to share a story that I might say, tell in a bar. And I actually, the last time I read with Corinne, I, um, I read a story that was based in a bar and it was quite dirty, um, but we're not going to do that now. Um, that was the fun part. Um, this is the part where a woman wakes up to a changed world and is trying to assess her complicity uh, within the situation she encounters. Uh, this is Claudia. <clears throat> Daylight pressed against her eyelids. A bright smear beamed between her glued lashes. Her head was beyond aching. It pulsed. The hangover occupied her entire body, spilling off the bled and pooling onto the floor, filling the room. She tipped her face to the window. Curtains parted onto a view of cloudless blue. Her eyes were sticky. So was her mouth. She closed her eyes again. The glare tackled her lids and from beneath, she saw a different planet, 
a red world veined with mauve. Birds chirped, a car started, tires scraped over asphalt, children shouted in Spanish, a woman shushed them, a car door slammed, she squeezed her eyes shut, scrunching her face, pain radiated from her temples. Claudia spread her hands on the bed, patting rough folds of cotton. She was naked and alone, but for two crumpled pillows. She reached between her legs, a swamp. Her period? She swiped at her lips and came up with silky black hairs too long to belong to her. Groaning, she turned her back to the window. She was alone now, but she hadn't been. Peter. She tucked both hands between her thighs. She'd had unprotected sex with the son of her best hope for a meaningful qualitative study. Everyone would find out if he felt like making it known and what man wouldn't. She swung her legs off the bed and sat up. Her headache expanded like a dying star. A stripe of dirt and flies lined the gray carpet where it tucked into the plastic baseboard. The sound of her own breath echoed in her ears. She was sore. The children outside screamed and laughed. A vacuum bumped around the room next to hers. Sometimes macaws worked these jobs. Even if they lived off the reservation, they'd talk. She'd have to erase the evidence. She turned her head to the door. It was not chained. She always chained the door. That meant they'd had sex here, or at least come back here. She fought an image of his face, careening in and out of focus above her. Her clothes were doubled over a chair. That's not how she would arrange them. He tidied up. Craning her neck, she checked the other nightstand. Her keys were stacked next to a full glass of water. Had she driven here? If not, she would be seen walking an exposed and dangerous stretch of highway that had no other purpose this morning but to shame her. If so, she should already be ashamed, and she was. She had violated every code of ethics she had ever agreed to hold sacred, and she did it on a whim, wasting herself. It couldn't be undone. She drained the glass, water running down both sides of her mouth. She would have to make herself presentable. Driving down Front Street was like strolling a promenade. Everyone checked you out. If there was a halfway decent chance they knew you, drivers waved or like weaved their cars to show they'd seen you. Claudia stood up to tug the Paisley curtains together, wondering if Peter left them parted on purpose. They stuck right where they were, loosing a light flurry of dust as a acrylic shimmied back into place. All right. No, he hadn't. She scurried to the bathroom, hiding her ass and avoiding the mirror and checked the wastebasket. No condom, no wrapper, not even a tiny torn off corner. Maybe he flushed them, but that wasn't it. She faced her reflection. Her shoulders and breasts bore rough red patches. Claudia pirouetted to check her back. On her neck, next to her spine, four bruises bloomed in a row, purple as pansies. Seeing them alarmed her. A shower, first things first. The motel stocked the kind of soap that splits in two when you open the wrapper and nothing else. It would have to do. Her fingers smelled like common cigarettes. She didn't dare take a whiff of her hair. She pulled the curtain and started the water, nearly falling out of the tub when a cold spray sputtered out of the shower head. Then again, cold water was better for washing off semen, a lesson learned while camping with her husband, Andrew. Early on in her marriage, she slept under the stars, unafraid, scoffing at tents, hair full of wood smoke, inviting dew. Early on, they zipped their sleeping bags together. Early on, they did all kinds of cheesy shit she used to love. When did she stop being young? When did she become used? She had no choice to start again. It was that or die alone, but not this man, this mistake. There was no future her, for her, not with Peter. She knew that. She presumed he did too. He wasn't stupid. Claudia peed herself to keep warm, focusing on the shower, which was almost hot. Everything would be okay. Things would get better the cleaner and emptier she got. It would be okay. She scoured her scalp with shards of soap, moving down her body in brusque circles. The water was cooling. By the time she got to her thighs, it was frigid. She let the icy stream blast her face. Swollen eyes rode her on a long night of hard drinking, and with no conditioner, there wasn't much she could do about her hair. The towels were the size of tissues and about the same thickness. She dried her hair with unwise flips of her head, reeling against the sink as her brain sloshed back into a place. Scrubbing her teeth with a wet towel corner, she rinsed and spat and searched for flashbacks to reconstruct her night. Kelly Green, yes, 
Yes. It began by playing pool. His bad break. No, no, no. It began with beers on the beach and the slow creep to Clallam Bay. Amber light in a tumbler and another and another. Had she ordered those drinks or did he bring them to her unasked? She couldn't remember paying for anything but the first round, which she did with cash in case she got stopped. She saw herself sink the eight ball, watched his face sharpen, his smile lines crystalline as he held the door on the way out. Stars tumbling to her right. Oh. The passenger seat, good. She hadn't driven. Warmth on her body, a hand on her throat. The clerk's call, oh, fuck. They were already famous. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> I love that passage. And now Corinne Manning. Corinne Manning's debut story collection, We Had No Rules, has received starred reviews from Booklist and Publishers Weekly, the latter noting it exquisitely examines queer relationships with equal parts humor, heartache, and titillation. Their stories and essays have been published widely, including In Toward an Ethics of Activism and Shadow Map, an anthology of survivors of sexual assault. Corinne is a writer in residence for writers in the schools and founded the James Franco Review, a project that sought to address implicit bias in the publishing industry. We Had No Rules has both deep polarity and deep ache. Like Corinne, these characters are at once tender and fierce, characters in revelation and as prophets, seeing through the world we live in with such precision and frank assertion. They write towards testament, making visible the codes we live and die by. But We Had No Rules is also fun and sensual and flat out sexy. Corinne's characters pursue their truth, hoping for connection, hoping for stable ground, hoping to navigate unknown intimacies and remaking themselves in the process. Tonight, Corinne will be reading excerpts of these stories from We Had No Rules. Lately, Corinne has been finding solace in coffee rituals of brewing with a spoonful of honey. They just finished The Warmth of Other Suns and are rereading To the Friend Who Did Not Save My Life. If Corinne were a flower, they'd be a wild rose because they wish they could have the kind of subtle thorns that remind and invite others to handle everything with care. Please help me give a warm welcome from afar to Corinne Manning. Nope, hold on. <laughs> Hold on, Corinne, you're muted. Okay, there you are, hi. <laughs> hi. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Hooray. Um, Piper, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, and to everyone, Kristen and EJ, your readings were so evocative and so tender and so beautiful and so ferocious. And so thank you so much. And I'm also really honored to be here with um, Paul Lasicki, who's an author who means a lot to me. And so I'm so grateful that we'll all get to be in conversation. I'm gonna read a couple excerpts from the title story, We Had No Rules. And um, you'll just be hearing some different parts from the beginning of the story. And I wanna say two things. Um, I love when the chat box is noisy and so, um, you know, if you're feeling scandalized, if you're feeling sad, if you um, like, if you are laughing, like, let me know. It's like a way of like being like, oh, people are alive out there. And um, the story is building up to a, a sexual act that may or may not be consensual. But in this part of the story, um, it has like more bittersweet things happening. We have no rules. My family had no rules, at least it felt that way for a time, because most of the rules were vague and unspoken. Don't lie or steal or hurt. If I was mean to my sister or my sister to me, we would apologize. We did the dishes together every night. We shared toys. When she read to me, I would thank her. And if I wanted her to read to me, she would, unless she had too much homework. Our parents' rules had to be enforced only after we broke them, after my sister broke them. 
By the time I was old enough to encounter the same dilemma, I already knew the edict and through watching her, I knew what rules to follow, which was why at 16, I left home just as my sister had, only I ran away because there was one rule I couldn't keep from breaking. If I knew anything about my parents, it was where they stood. So why expect different results? I was lucky because when it was my turn, Stacy was 24, set up in a rent controlled apartment in Chelsea with only two roommates. She worked as a paralegal and attended classes at Hunter most nights. It was 1992 and I had a place to go. Stacy was mad at first. She held my hand as we walked from the subway to her apartment and I felt so much better now that my hand had a place to be. My hands get icy when I'm nervous. When I was little, Stacy used to rub them until they were warm again, and I wondered if she remembered this. I felt small and untethered as we walked down those streets because I smelled perfume and trash and urine, saw posters of men kissing and women kissing, and because over the din of cars and voices, I heard the roaring immensity of what I'd done. You gave them what she wanted, they said. Sorry, you gave them what they wanted, she said. She jerked my hand as we turned a corner. I hadn't seen, seen Stacy since she left and she'd gone through a complete transformation. She traded running shoes for leather boots that went up to just over her knees and had huge heels. She towered over me by almost a foot. The bangles on her wrist clanked together and her hair, which was shaved when I last saw her, a roll broken, was a gorgeous orange mess. She had a unique kind of insight into what I was going through. You made it easy for them. They want you to feel so ashamed that you leave. There's this way they pretend there's no rules and they subtly suffocate you. That's what they did to me, only they posed it as a choice. If you wanted to do it differently, you would have given them the ultimatum, like either you accept me and we talk about this or I'm getting the fuck out of here. I pulled my hand out of her grip to adjust my shoulder bag, but I regretted it because afterwards her hand wasn't available anymore. She shoved it into the pocket of her neon yelling, yellow hunting vest. I stayed close to her, taking as much comfort as I could from the rub of her arm against mine. We paused at a traffic light and I could tell she wanted to bolt across, but she was trying to set a good example of how to cross the street. I leaned into her a little more. I'd rather be with you though, I said. I wanted to be with you. It had been a long time since I'd seen her cry, and there was this way that tears just suddenly flooded around her lids. You wouldn't have known she was upset until this happened, like a mysterious dam had been opened. She grabbed my hand and rubbed her thumb briskly over my skin, then we ran together across the street. That first morning, she took me to her favorite bakery and watched me eat two chocolate chip banana muffins, mine and hers. Look, I'm not going to totally police you, but you just can't bring home any girl because you have to remember that this, also, this is also a home to all of us. And if you and some girl decide to fuck Stacy, I looked around to see if anyone had heard, but no one seemed bothered. If you decide to fuck, you have to be respectful, no shouting. I don't wanna hear cause you're my baby sister and Jill's room is right against that closet you sleep in. And you don't wanna do that to her either. I've already told Jill and Toby this, but I'm gonna say it to you too. Don't fuck my roommates. You can have sex with anyone as long as they aren't living with us at the time. You need to realize this. She leaned forward real close and I stopped chewing. You and I are partners now and I worked hard to get this clean, safe apartment with these not so clean, stable people. And if you fuck it up, we are both out. And I know you don't know this yet, but sex is really fucking messy and what you get into will affect me too. I know about sex, I said. Stacy smiled and tried to hide it. I'm pretty sure all you've done is hold hands under the covers at a sleepover and she let you kiss her neck while she pretended to be asleep. I looked down and picked up some crumbs from the wax paper with my pointer and put them in my mouth. She was definitely awake, I said. <laughs> I'm gonna take care of you, she said. We're gonna figure out school and I'll help you find a job. You won't go through what I went through, okay? She looked at me so seriously. I nodded. I know that wasn't enough of an acknowledgement, but the fact that I even nodded is commendable, I think, at 16. I didn't know at this point what she went through. I knew it was terrible because early on she called my parents and left this message on the answering machine that made me tremble and cry because she was sobbing and saying she wanted to come home. She left a number for a payphone 
And when she answered, her voice sounded like mine, like a child's. And I begged my mom to get on the phone and listen. And my mom just kept saying, you made your choice. You made your choice. And I heard my sister on the other end screaming, please, please. The words scraping away, digging for anything decent, but striking rock after rock. I hid in the other room until finally one of them hung up. The phone rang, it rang and rang, and I followed the sound to the kitchen. This was my first view of Jill who sat reading the paper in a tank top and boxers. She was very pale. Her hair was dyed black and shaved underneath. And although that made her seem a little tougher than my sister, when she looked up at me, there was something flamboyantly soft about her. Don't answer it, mister, she said, we scream. A man's voice snapped on and I jumped. Hi, this is Anthony, I like long messages. The machine beeped and there was the crackling sound of a phone returning to its cradle. Who is that, I asked. Jill took a slow sip from her mug. Anthony, this is his apartment. I looked over my shoulder. Then where is he? He's dead, she said, like it was very boring, very common. She turned the page. Oh, okay, I said, then what from? She looked up at me, the virus. It took me a moment to put it together, but when I did, I stated AIDS very loudly, like I'd seen a spider, like the virus was on me. The panic hit me so hard that I would have started crying if I wasn't so afraid of Jill. She looked at me with compassion, but her voice was still laced with boredom. You can't catch it from living here. It's transmitted through sharing needles or through, no or through blood or unprotected sex. Want some coffee? I didn't like coffee, but I said, sure. She poured it into a cracked teacup with roses on it. She added tons of milk and sugar, then motioned to the seat across from her. I'm a girl, I said. She squinted at me. I just, you called me Mr. before, so I just wanted to make sure you knew. She shut one eye, opened it, then shut the other. Of course, bad habit. Last thing I wanna do is fetishize my roommate's kid's sister, tis forbidden. Is today your day off, I asked. Her lipstick was so red that even though there was a mark on her coffee cup, there was still plenty on her lips, which she pursed as she folded the paper. Sure is. If you were me, what would you do with today? She undressed in front of me, and when she took off her shirt, I looked away, but I didn't when she was taking off her boxers because she was talking to me at that point, and I thought she would have panties on underneath. So when I saw her bush, darker and thicker than mine, her furry thighs pinched around it. I pretended like I dropped something and bent down to look for it. What did you drop? She asked. A bobby pin I was playing with. I didn't see anything fall, she said, and took a step towards me, still bottomless, to help me look for it, I thought. But she put the clothes I was to borrow on the bed, then picked up a sequin dress from the floor and slipped it over her head. Found it. I opened my hand then closed it quickly, but she didn't even look. She was fiddling with something on her dress, so I stepped into the kitchen to change. From the doorway, I stared at her unmade bed while I pulled on the suit pants. I wondered how many people she had slept with. I put on the Depeche Mode t-shirt and tucked it in. On cue, she stuck her head around the doorframe, untucked, and pulled the front and back out. Your sister's like a redwood, but you and I are about the same height, little shrubs. She smiled just inches from my face, and this was the first time I had to smile at someone who was standing this close to me, whose bush I'd seen, and who I didn't know very well. She helped me clip on the suspenders, but I wasn't sure where to let the straps rest. On the outside of my breasts, on the inside, definitely not on top of them. I had a breast reduction, she said. I looked at her chest. We threw a fundraiser. I looked at my reflection in Jill's mirror. My sister and I had matching breasts, but on me they looked heavy and uncomfortable, which they were. The suspenders made them seem worse. Can I just let the suspenders hang down? I asked. Absolutely. Then she pulled on a fur coat splattered with red paint. She told me she found it in the trash like that. Once we were outside, she slipped her hand in mine. Is this okay? She asked. I nodded. It's just that our outfits look so much better this way. I'll stop there. Thank you. Hey, Corinne, I love that story. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so I'm gonna hop off here in a minute, but before I do, Paula Sicky. 
Paul Asicki is our moderator for the evening. He is the author of five books, including Later, My Life at the Edge of the World, The Narrow Door, and Famous Builder. He has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment of the Arts, among others. He teaches in the MFA program at Rutgers University and lives in Brooklyn. Paul will be moderating our conversation on literary kinship between Corinne, Kristen, and EJ. If you have any questions to add, feel free to drop them in the comment box now and throughout their conversation. We hope to get to as many as we can tonight. Please help me welcome Paul, EJ, Kristen, and Corinne. I'm going to unmute you all. You all have to be unmuted, though. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, those readings were amazing. Thank you so much, Piper, for being such a great host. And um, But the readings were so were full of so much aliveness and wit and specificity and vision and tenderness. And I'm so excited about our conversation. And I thought we'd first, I, I'd ask you some questions about the books and how they came into being, how they came into the world, and then um, move to some larger questions about literary community, just to give us some idea of a shape for the next hour. Um, but we can mess that up too. I don't want to get too stringent and tidy. Um, okay, the first question I thought I'd ask is like, what has it been like to publish a book during the strange, strange year of 2020? It had to have been different from what you expected. And I know that's a broad and general question, but I'm, I'm really curious about your responses. I mean, you know, I would like to start by saying that Corinne and I, years ago at the Till Residency at Smoke Farm, which is a wonderful nonprofit art space that is community run, um, and it's beautiful. And uh, she and I were in the garden. Uh, they and I were um, hanging out and we were talking about uh, this journey that we've been on, this impossible journey and feeling like it was never going to end, You know that there was not going to be a moment when we could actually share this work with the world. And despite the fact that we've been published in a pandemic, I've been so pleased, Corinne, to see all the fantastic reviews and reception for your work. It's so well-deserved. And you hung in there. You kept going. You defeated obstacles. You know, we triumphed over adversity. <laughs> and I should have known that right at the end, there'd be like a pandemic to come like clobber, you know, like right, you know, at the, right when we're like, okay, oh, it's gonna be great. We're gonna relax, it's gonna happen, hang out, do, their, do our events. You know, thanks to Elliot Bay for, hosting this since that, that was supposed to be your launch was it going to be at Elliott Bay Book Company itself. And they were going to, um, you know, stock the launch at, at Hugo House. But re re despite all of that, I do feel like people are reading. And I'm glad to see that they're reading well, because I've been watching the reception for uh, We Had No Rules, and it's been real and sustained, you know, and I feel like maybe this knowledge that we are together in our aloneness is something that is a truth that is held in literature that people often forget and because of the crush of the world. And now at this time, it's possible to, to actually reach more people because they get it. You know, they're, they're, they're copying to the aloneness that James Baldwin speaks of in that essay on the creative process. You know, they can't deny it anymore. You know, we can't deny it anymore. And the truth is that even in this separation, all of these books are available for true like soul connection. So um, that's me finding the joy. <laughs> what about you, Corinne? You know, I really, you know, I think I will say that um, when the when it was clear that you know all the events were going to get canceled i would, i had trouble like imagining how things would translate onto you know whatever platforms that we're using um and then i have really been struck actually by the 
intimacy and it which has been really interesting so like even though like you know I love reading and seeing you know the the comments rolling over in the corner of my eyes it gives me that sense of community but then there's something so much more intimate about the people that I'm reading with too I feel like we're actually in this like this closer communion um and I feel really lucky for the book that I wrote it feels really appropriate for this time that has all these characters that are questioning and searching, but my hope has been, this is not something that I even thought about um, previously, but that there's this way that this time kind of transformed, I think this book into being a source of company because there's so many different characters. And I think especially for, um, you know, for at least some queer folks, a sense of community from it. And I feel really grateful to be here with the three of you, Kristen, Paul, and EJ, because I feel like we all put out actually like quite intimate books for this time. Um, I was emailing with Paul and there was a line from um, his book and I was rereading the beginning of it the other day where, and he's, uh, Paul, you're talking about, um, you're talking about AIDS in 1991, but you say the air we breathe is drenched in its possibility. And even though this, uh, this, this health crisis is very different from um, the, the AIDS crisis as it was and as it is, I, um, there's something about the way in which I feel that kind of speaking to this moment now. Um, and yeah, and like both Kristen and EJ, like I feel like both of your books are, are so alive and necessary for exactly this moment, especially like in thinking about like EJ with like translations and connections. And I feel like Kristen, that's also alive in your book too. It's like, how do we communicate? How do we cross these, um, these uh, bridges that systems of, in the case of your book, like systems of oppression have put up for us. So I just feel like there's a way in which it's um, a hard publishing. And I think especially the kind of books that all of us are publishing are already hard to get out. Um, but there's a way in which this time for these particular books to be out, I think is very interesting. Yeah, that's great, great. What about you, EJ? I feel like um, a lot of, of right things have been said, so I have very little to add to that. But maybe, you know, one funny thing is it's, it's much harder to say, oh, I don't know if I should say this, but it's a little harder to, to say no to things because. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> totally. You're like, I'm oh so gosh. curious about why you think that because I've been feeling that in myself. You know, and, and I feel um, really bad. Like, even if I don't know if I can do something, if I feel like, oh, that's like a good thing, then I'll just say yes and then try to figure it out. But it's harder because I think, you know, they'll be like, well, what are you doing that day? It's like, oh, I'm home. <laughs> oh, um, you're not going anywhere, right? <laughs> oh, no. But I, you know, I wanted to like rest at home. And they're like, oh, but you know, you could just jump on. And it's like, oh, you're right. <laughs> so it's a little, little harder to say no. And um, it's also easier to participate, like this sort of um, mass participation. I know um, when we were talking, Paul, about having you here, first of all, we're like, D do you think he'd say yes? <laughs> do, you, do you think so? I don't know. <laughs> We've got to try because it's a wild time. But so thank you for being here. Oh, I know you're and Kristen and we were just so excited. But um, like something like this, right? Like this would not be uh, so easy to do. And, and that makes it really a, a treat to see you and to, to go to other readings that I wouldn't be able to go to. Like yesterday, I, I went to a reading in, in Boston, I think, or, or I went to it, but it was nice, you know? Yeah. This girl here, doing here from Seattle, it's like, oh, I'm here. <laughs> so it, it, it's, got its, it's got its things. Yeah, I know I've been to more readings, I think, in the, the past month than I've been to <laughs> You know, in the previous year, and yeah, you know, there, there's there's stuff happening all the time, and there's something delightful about looking at a calendar and thinking, oh, I could be in Minneapolis, or I could be in Seattle or Houston on any given night or afternoon. Um, I'm curious about um, how your book started. Like, what um, you know, what was the first story? 
what was the first um, scene you wrote and how did the book evolve um, from that seed? Is that hard? <laughs> I don't know if I'd like it myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, EJ, I love your story. Can you tell yours? And also you should say no to me because also you should say no to events. I feel like you should get to rest. <laughs> I, love I love being here and I'm so, so excited. You, you've always been there for me and this is very, very least I can do. So yeah, when, when I started, it's really interesting. It was originally just my mother's letters. Um, it's my mother's letters she wrote me while we lived apart. So when I was 15, she her and my dad left for South Korea and they left me and my brother here. And we just uh, lived apart and I pretended to have like have parent be at home for the next nine years or so until we reunited. But my mother would write me these letters during that time. And that's sort of the, the heart of the memoir, I think. So it started as just a, a, a book of translations. It was 49 translations and I never intended it for it to be a memoir, it was just, um, I had an introduction and the letters and then I sent it out and I got to, to all the publishing houses and it was a massive no. And at the time I was like, oh, that's okay. I'll, I'll come back with something different. And then I learned that with you know, a lot of publishing houses a no is, is not like a comeback later. It's like a no forever. <laughs> it's, a, it's a, oh, well, no. Oh, damn. serious note and I wanted to get some feedback and I, I I'm so glad that that happened it I think it took me another uh, five or six years after that but I'm glad that happened because it, it seemed that the feedback I was getting was you know the letters are so wonderful but they're wonderful because of the context of that introduction and if you can find a way to turn that two pages to 200 pages um this, you know, you have something here you can really share if you're willing to, to dig for that. And so if you look at the number of pages of my memoir, it's almost exactly 200 pages, 200 and mm -hmm. front matter, back matter, but it's like 204 or five pages. So I, I was really, I really stuck to that and the memoir came. Great. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, I know for me, I, you're not obligated to answer. Yeah. You don't have to like. You don't have to be AWP. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for me, can you guys hear me? I had yes. um, okay. Um, I had originally been working on this novel for you know since 2007, and then um, and it had like a queer family in it, and then in 2012, I was actually someone showed me. Um, I think the real world of publishing I was coming into and um, just kind of said, uh, you know, with this, this idea that, you know, this book will, just so you know, this book is not gonna ever be read as a mainstream novel. It has, um, you know, too many queer characters in it. Um, and um, it's gonna, it, just so you know, it's gonna be considered genre. And I had this huge reaction because I was like, oh, I had censored myself from how I really wanted to write the whole time because I was trying, I thought I was trying to write a mainstream novel or like the MFA novel and I had failed anyway. And then I kind of looked at, um, you know, I think it just kind of like made me confront all of my internalized homophobia too, that I was like, well, why do I, why am I upset that it's on, would be on the LGBT genre shelf because actually all of my favorite books are on that shelf. Um, and so I didn't, I had trouble writing for, you know, at least like a few months. And then this one day I um, sat down trying to write again. And then I wrote uh, the line, oh, fuck it, I'm writing lesbian fiction. And that ends up being the first line to my story, Gay Tale, which I wrote in one sitting from start to finish. And all the other stories followed suit. And the stories themselves became an opportunity for me to um, dismantle all of that shame that I had um, built up about what was appropriate and what was appropriate in literature. And, um, and it became this really um, freeing experience where every time I sat down to write, I had to write a story from beginning to end in one sitting. Um, and I also had the constraint that if anything felt shameful or if anything felt embarrassing or if I felt scared, I had to write it. Even if um, I 
knew that it was didactic or whatever. Like I had to just like break every rule that I had, um, that I feel like I had learned. And in that way, I finally found my own authenticity. So that's what this book, how that book came to be. And it's what it means to me. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think similarly to you, Corinne, I was told various ways that I could bring subduction into mainstream publication. I could uh, make the anthropologist character a savior. <laughs> That's not what the book is about. You know, it's about the opposite. You know, um, I, I could make her fresher. Um, I could, uh, which was the code for younger, right? Make her more nurturing. I won't give you the spoilers for all the things they wanted to change at the end, uh, but the pressure was there. And if there's a reason why every song on the radio sounds the same, right? There is a commercial market pressure that people want so badly to be allowed in, you know, that many of us are willing to do almost anything to just be allowed in, you know? And that's why I was so grateful that uh, Red Hen Press uh, chose to let Claudia be as compromised and damaged as she is, uh, and to let Peter be as compromised and damaged as he is. And in my own patience for kind of exploring that damage, uh, which is also a trip through the self, right? Anytime that we create a character, we are also exploring the vagaries of our human interactions over the many years, even if that character has nothing to do with our behaviors or actions or thoughts you just end up uh, reckoning with humanity. And <clears throat> I had a strange moment. I've never told anyone this. I'll just tell you now uh, because it's like, a, it's a strange moment, but I had been on deadlines for so long. I was a, a deadline journalist, Paul, uh, working at the Seattle Post Intelligencer. And I'd gone out to Nia Bay and um, by myself on a long road trip. Um, this is back 15 years ago. And I went out to one of the beaches and you know, when you're on deadlines like that, you're kind of given this sense of duty and uh, that it's real, that what the work that you're doing is of service to society. It's the best way you can provide. And you literally flatten yourself on a daily basis to do it. Um, you just, you let the world in, it crushes you, you, obli you like obliterate your uh, personhood and you become a vessel for um, a hope for, for change and betterment in society. And that uh, self-sacrifice and almost masochism, you know, of that gets ingrained in your psyche. So it's hard to let yourself off of that once you've really dedicated yourself to deadline journalism or beat reporting. And so I'm on this beach and I just, you know, thought, you know, when I have a moment, I read novels. That's what I love to do. It's the thing that I love. It's what saved me as a child. You know, I, I want to write a book and I know that it's going to take so long. And I don't know that it's hard to sometimes explain to yourself that that the time that you would spend creating a long form work of art is worth it. You know, I'm having these thoughts and then this, um, it was a very gray day, the pewter skies of the Pacific Northwest, right? And it's, you know, almost about to rain. And then this, the clouds part of the sunspot like blazes upon the ocean and just dances around for like 20 minutes. And I'm like, and I'm thinking, and it allowed me, it gave me time because usually I'd be like, oh, I'm going to pack up my stuff and go. I'm going to head back. I'm going to get home. Do, and it just made me stop and be riveted, you know? And I thought if having this moment of dedication to art provides me access to being riveted, you know, and, and ravaged by the world and to connect and be open to its beauties and be flayed by them too, then, then that's worthwhile. Um, so 15 years later, here we are. That's great. <laughs> I'm curious, I know all of you, I mean, as you just said, um, Kristen, all of you, or at least some of you have worked in other art forms, I mean, in other, for other genres of writing, I should say. And I'm curious about how those other forms fed this current book and what you had to say no to. Oh, I love that question. And I kind of want you to answer it. <laughs> and the reason I want you, <laughs> want you to no, answer I think, it. Yeah, I do. You know, I don't think of myself as having a primary genre, even right. though the last two books have, you know, have been classified as memoir slash nonfiction. But, you know, I came into writing 
um, through the, the window first of music and then to poetry and then to fiction and, and then to where I am now. And I feel like, you know, the, the conventions of music and harmonic structure and phrasing are my first teachers. Like that's, I mean, I keep going back to that world and I feel like that I'm, whatever I'm doing is in conversation with, um, you know, my first language. I, mean, I, I want something to feel as unbidden and light and complex as a song. So yeah, it's, I, I feel like wherever I've gotten has been through like multiple translations. That's beautiful. Yeah, because I was thinking about with with later, you know, the way every, you know, every um, vignette is titled. And I wonder, I, like, wondered how much of it you, like, just like knowing your background, knowing how you're working multiple genres at once, how much of it you, like, had to arrange and um, in order to, like, how much of it was, like, written in one go and how much was, were you like collaging it through? Well, it actually was a much more straightforward book in its first iteration, in its first draft. It was in past tense. It felt super resolved and too neat to me. So the process of that book involved sort of tearing it apart um, over and over so it could accommodate um, other forms. So it could, you know, a certain section could feel like a poem or a certain section could feel like an essay or another could be shaped according to you know the dynamics of a scene so yeah I, I i just wanted it to keep morphing from section to section so yeah i'm just interested in that you know that question in regard to um you know your books like if like i'm curious like ej your first book is a book of poetry i'm wondering about you know the, the dialogue between um poetic form and and what you're writing right now i mean do you still think i mean have you do you think still imagine think of yourself as a poet or as i mean are you still I, might the book be a book of poetry <laughs> I do. Well, um, really quickly, Paul, like I, I, I read an interview of yours where you talk about how your book was first in past tense and then you changed it to present tense. And I was reading an excerpt of later and I read it in past tense because I was just curious. <laughs> and so it, it's, it's the part where, you know, the, the gentleman stands up in the movie theater. But I read that whole section in past tense and I was like, oh, he he's right. The, the present tense is really, it, feel, it feels like um, just different. I don't know how to explain it, but I, I love that. I feel like I, I learned a lot from you sharing your experience. I think similarly to you, um, I, I came to poetry through dance. So I was a, a, oh, I never say this. I was a competitive hip hop dancer in Los Angeles for maybe two years, maybe uh, I, I competed for two years and then I taught for a year and it just was not, um, oh, I, this was not happening. <laughs> I, I was a very different person. And so it was actually my counselor that told me, oh, you should try this poetry class because you're failing um, college so badly. So, and that's how I got into poetry. But I, but like you, I think I go back to dance a lot, to be honest. Dance lets me sort of look look at, it helps me look at a poem on a page and I'm very particular about almost like choreography, the way the words are ordered and the, the space. Like I feel particular about um, the length of passages and the length of sentences and things like rhythm, things like that are just so much fun to me. I love, and, and that must be similar if, if you're sort of keeping a beat with a passage. But I know for me visually, it was important. Like in that chapter, I have I switch to poetry. There's a moment in which um, my great grandfather is sort of going through something, and I felt at that moment, oh, I can't, um, I can't say this any other way except through visual poetry. And so I did that. There's a moment in the book where it shows um, what it, what visually seems like a stoning. So it's like father between two roads. And so I, I, I sort of draw that out into paren in parentheses. And so. I guess what I'm trying to say is I, 
I feel lucky because like having several languages, if I feel like something's not quite happening, I, I, I get to shift a little bit and, and look at it another way. So there's poetry and it's helping me say something. But if you read my poetry book, it's actually the exact same thing as my memoir just said in poetry form. But it's almost like I took the, the poetry book and I said, oh, I'm going to say everything I want about my mom. And then and then I took the memoir and said, oh, the memoir lets me say things I didn't know I wanted to say, about oh. my mom, if that makes sense. And yeah. so the, the new genre helps me sort of get an extra squeeze in there. Um, and so I've, I've been having little experiences like that, but I always, when I read my own work, like what you said in your interview, I always say that if I can explain exactly what it is and what it's doing, then I, I, I don't appreciate it as much. I kind of want to feel lost. I'm not sort of creating the world before me. I want to create a world that surrounds me so much so that I, at the end of the book, I, I almost can't explain what happened or what I've done. And so that's that little touch of magic is so um, important to me. Yeah, that's so, so beautifully said. I'm so excited that we have that recorded and we can <laughs> listen to that, think about it and yeah, and be taught by it. Um, Kristen, did you want to talk to that question? Yeah, you know, for me, the hardest thing was breaking out of the um, being conditioned to to think about being a voice only in the third person, depersonified. Uh, so, and what I realized through investigative reporting, there is a lot of work that you can do in the third person, never referencing your own positionality, never referencing your own interiority. And you can have a very warm and humane approach to the world in that format, but it forecloses so much. Mm -hmm. And yet we're taught, and it also does another thing, because I was always the, the only, one of the very few, if not the only Latinas in the newsrooms in which I was operating. And so it essentially um, subsumed my, uh, you know, my identity and denatured and deracinated my intellect, disembodied my creative production and put it into the terms of a white male voice um, that would be enforced by copy editors, if not, you know, produced by me in self sublimation, you know, which happens so much and, that, and, and freeing yourself from that tyranny of self erasure, like you were talking about Corinne, is one of the most important steps. And so I wanted to create fiction uh, that also allowed for a deep exploration of the interiority and positionality of the protagonists. And, and then doing that, you know, um, really uh, opened up the lack of access that I had had or given to my own personal experience. So then I started writing personal essays, um, which, you know, saved me during the years of uh, seeking publication for my novel, um, without that outlet to uh, to refract my concerns in a truer way from a character who was who was I, who is me, um, and yet is also uh, stylized, right? Because it's on on the page. Um, doing that helped me, I think, begin to. Uh, align the various selves that had been dislocated by our society. And I always come back to Baldwin on this point because he speaks so beautifully about the ways in which we are separated from ourselves and wandering this wilderness alone, not even in possession of our own selves, our own experience. And strangely, perhaps not strangely, but writing fiction brought me closer to the truth of my life. Um, and I've been ever, ever since like just trying, you know, trying and trying to be brave enough to publish all my essays. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, <laughs> there's a lot of emotional labor that comes with putting an essay into the world, right? right. right. There's a lot of work you need to do with the people who are referenced in it within the self. Have you evolved enough, you know, to tell this story? Um, the reckoning, the beauty of writing a novel is that it does force you into, because of the length, into that kind of longer term uh, reconciliation. With an essay, it's possible to write it in one sitting, as you say, Corinne, with your stories, which just astounds me that you write some of those in one, in, in one sitting. It's beautiful. 
Um, so maybe when after this, I'm going to call you um, and you're going to tell me how you do that. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't happen anymore. It was like a gift from, you know, you know, Satan or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it came from the hell mouth. <laughs> that makes it sound so fun. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Love Satan. <laughs> Did, did you want to talk to that, um, Corinne, or? Gosh, all of your answers were so beautiful. And I guess all I'll say is that, you know, poetry um, has just like really, poetry was like, um, or I think is just still like the genre I like feel my way through and think my way through. And um, this book surprised me because like unlike my the other books I'm working on, I feel like it's the most direct. Um, of any of those. And so there's a way in which I was saying perhaps no in order to actually be as direct as possible in these stories. But the way in which I found the voices, I feel like, you know, you know, that moment when you're with poetry where, and maybe for a lot of you writing fiction and nonfiction is the same way, but where you have to just listen so deeply um, and wait. And I think that aspect was very much alive in these stories where it was like, I would kind of listen and I would catch the voice and I would move with it. Um, so that was how I had to like, kind of work through the yes and no. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions about community. I'm curious about where you first felt a sense of literary community. You know, what did you, you know, what, um, what was given to you in that experience and what did you bring back to it? To make it more complicated than the initial question. I would Did like to say, like, I'll, I'll start. Memory? I feel like for myself, I, you know, it started in school in a workshop and I thought, oh, I, I kind of, I like these people, they think like me and you know, and then there was like an artist colony and then something else. And then I, you know, I, I arrived in Provincetown and like all these, um, I don't know, like elements sort of lined up. And, you know, I, I know that that experience changed my work on, you know, a cellular level. And I think it's still changing my work that particular experience that um, let in, well, not only other writers, but visual artists. And, um, you know, I think the old requirements of writing a publishable story didn't so much matter anymore because the visual artists um, only cared whether a story felt fresh or alive. They didn't care if your story was gonna be published in the New Yorker next week because they didn't want to be bored. And I think my work changed on so many levels when I, I, I held it to that bar rather than to, you know, what we've been talking about, all of those external requirements or expectations around traditional publishing. I'm so glad you had a wonderful workshop experience in your graduate program because I did not have that. Um, I was very lucky to encounter certain people who changed my life, like Alyssa Washuda, for example. I met her at UW. She was so kind and generous. She has remained this guide star for me as an intellect, as a literary leader, as someone who, um, who, who believes in her work and makes choices about her work um, against pressures, uh, which is a beautiful kind of bravery. But the workshops at my graduate program were, and this is funny to me because I had literally gone up against corporate titans, elected officials. I had had, my stories had caused federal criminal investigations. They had invoked, you know, the FBI, they, you know, there was a state Supreme Court rank, uh, sanctioned recall effort. I mean, they were controversial, but I was never so unsafe as in some of the workshops I participated in, in graduate school. And unfortunately, there was very little um, entree given to what are the ethics of workshopping nonfiction? 
you know, what are ways that you can introduce language that can, I was workshopping fiction at the time, but it was a, it was a blended program. And I also took poetry and studied with Heather McHugh, which is amazing experience. Um, and so people were so bad and down by that, you know, that they weren't able to really connect in the way that I would have expected. And I, and I left my program disappointed, um, despite McHugh, who's a zany genius. Um, and despite you know, the support of Sean Wong, for example, who um, wrote me a beautiful blurb for Subduction and has been 15 years of supporting me and being kind. You know? But nonetheless, I, I was um, damaged uh, by the experience that I had. And it took moving outside of the academy and being in uh, the literary spaces of Seattle, um, open mics, uh, the Cheap Beer and Prose series, which was one of my first uh, big readings, you know, which is at Hugo House. Hugo House made a space for me that they really, to this day, have given me a space where I could flourish. And they did so with a sense for my opportunity and my future, rather than a withering, which is what I felt was happening to so many souls uh, through this other academic process. And the idea, and also the Center in Port Townsend uh, Writers Conference, um, for whatever reason, when I go out to that conference, uh, artistic director is uh, Sam Ligon, an amazing human being who uh, has done so much for my literary life. But people get together, we play music. I mean, because of that, like, you know, Kim Adonizio and Gary Lilly and Sam Ligon and Kate Lebo and Dee Dee Wiggly and I, like, played music at Hugo House, like it did, a, it affected a cross-pollination, which is what I had always hoped for. The, the idea that you could be tender and absurd and fumble and still be loved, you know, still be held. Um, that was when I started really finding community. And then once I found that actually, um, then I decided that that was going to be like my Care Bear stare. <laughs> that I was going to just radiate that out in case anybody else had gone through what I had gone through without the confidence of knowing that these emerging writers in their late 20s did not have, and these, you know, uh, didn't, you know, in the workshop um, were not the last word, right, on each other's quality, mm -hmm. right? And also to give them the grace, right? And to give myself the grace at that time of seeking too much from a group that had too little time to really, you know, come together in a way that would affect a transformation of the work long term. For that, I think hanging in there is is useful. Um, so, for example, I could see Corinne over the years uh, building community online through radio, uh, creating the James Franco Review, um, that Furnace series that meant so much to me, you know, and you see people do their work and you see that work echo and reverberate throughout the community and you realize that the work is valuable and it gives you um it gives you courage to try it yourself to build something rather than waiting for something to happen for you or for anybody else you can actually just make it happen you know and and for that you need to hang in there and be observant and then once you recognize the good work people are doing then try to like contribute to it yeah. you know that's great um corinne or ej I have like another question that I can ask that's sort of interrelated with that, just looking at the clock and I wanna make sure some of our audience members get to have their questions presented. But um, you know, what can literary community mean right now in this time of isolation? Is that a tough one? Like how do we, how do we make community in this challenging situation, what, what can we do on even just a minute level to make that happen? How do we make this up right now in an era when we don't have, you know, external plans to tell us what to do? Friend, do you want me to say something really quick? Yeah, you go ahead. I'm still, it's forming still. So. I've been rolling this idea in my head and you can tell me it sounds a little crazy. But, um, you know, I, when I think of community, I think it the word naturally evokes something out there. It evokes um, a location and it seems 
attached to something you have to go to and you have to make the choice to sort of physically move there. And, and I've been thinking about how community is also just, um, <laughs> now it does sound really weird, but community is, is also here. It's not necessarily, oh, I, I need to go and find the community for me. It's the idea that I myself, through my choices and my work and through the way I, I share that work or help others with their work, that instantly creates a community, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so yeah. the community yeah. begins to reverberate around me, not me as its center, but me getting the initiative to, to work through um, what I look like as a community and, and helping people that way. And so I, I think more than a singular community, I see several sort of communities come up and to be a part of those things um, uh, across those I, I think there's something happening there that's interesting to me and that I am slowly striving toward, though I can't quite articulate it. I think that's it's tremendously said. It's really beautiful. <laughs> so nice. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I really appreciate that, EJ. And I think especially that notion of, I really appreciate that you said too at the end that you're still forming it. Because I think one of the things I've been thinking about is actually like, well, um, how do we seize or move with this moment so that new, like, so that communing can become actually more intentional, more tender, um, and actually more connected than we were when we could do the one-armed hug, um, <laughs> you know, and um, I think the like intimacy of, um, you know, and I think about like friends who I've gone on like social distanced walks and with some of them we're wearing masks and all I can see are their eyes and like sort of this like what they do, what a friend will do with their eyes. Um, when I talk to a friend on the phone, how they use their voice. Um, and, and so I think I'm kind of curious about like, what are the ways that we can start to um, actually harness the, the, the tenderness and the carefulness that we're having to approach um, one another and our work. Um, so I don't know, this is not, I feel like this is not like a a solution-based answer, but I think that there's a lot of possibility. And I know that like, I really, one of the things that really um, made me panic, I mean, among many other reasons, when, um, when as we moved to the stay at home order, um, but one was this like the rush, the rush to like do and solve and fix and I was just like, I was just so um, desirous of just like a moment to pause, you know, and um, and to be with it and to like find the flow and to find what it means to be friends. I mean, I think that's the thing. I'm like, how do I, how do I be a friend? <laughs> you know, like if I can't fix something through like how I look to someone in person and how my full body appears. And if I'm just a voice or I'm just language on a phone, like how, like, how does that actually work? And I think we're still discovering that. That's terrific. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna read a couple of questions from our lovely audience. And um, here is one. I know you're all launching books right now, but I'm curious whether you're working on new projects. Please say, yes, we want more. <laughs> Well, EJ, you have some good news, right? You have the paperback issue of with a beautiful cover. Oh, right, right, right. I have the reissue of my poetry book coming oh, out. Oh, great. That, that's really nice to revisit that. It's, you yeah. have it with you? Uh, you have it on your desk? It, um, it's, it's, it's still due and it'll, it'll, want, it'll come out in June. So, yeah, I'm really excited about 
Corinne, I want to hear your answer because I'm like, what are you working on? Tell me. <laughs> yeah, I'm working on um, I'm working on a book of auto fiction um, right now called Dirty Joke, and it's looking at um, looking at like uh, abuse in families. I'm and I'm particularly interrogating Italian American families, which is um, which is my background. Manning is an assimilation name. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm named after my grandma, who's Karina. You know, just like I kind of I'm looking a lot, I'm kind of really interrogating assimilation, and I'm also looking at um, how um, how immigrate, like the um, what gets carried over in immigration, how we get frozen in time, and so I think a lot about how um, at least the Italian Americans that I'm part of were frozen in time at the time of Mussolini, and never got to progress, um, and and that that gets carried on as Italian culture in the US. Wow. Um, and, you know, so I'm thinking about things like that. And, and, you know, but I'm thinking about it in terms of like, you know, my own um, experience of family and um, uh, it's all written in vignettes. And yeah, so that's what I'm right now, actually, I've been working really hard to have like a readable draft for my partner by June 1st. And so, um, <laughs> and it's cool. It's like coming, to, it's coming together, and it's really great. Um, you have you have four days. I know four <laughs> days. I'm almost there. Yeah. Pause. <laughs> yeah, I'm almost there. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, uh, um, Kristen, did you want to answer that? Yeah, you know, um, in 2016, uh, I began researching my second book. Um, it always astounds me to hear my timelines. Like, I'm like, what have you been doing? <laughs> Get to work, <laughs> you know, but, um, it's based in there's, it's a hybrid book. There's a, um, there's a, a part of it set in ancient Rome in a mother goddess worshiping cult that dominated pagan Rome, uh, right up till the, uh, advent of Christianity and the transition from that pagan, uh, belief to Christianity, which began siphoning off a lot of the um, structures of the religion, like the Passion Week, uh, which was uh, at the very same time as this seven-day festival to celebrate this resurrected, you know, God um, who was born without a father and dead without sons, um, which in the Roman pantheon was very unusual because a very fertile group of people, you know, a group of gods there, you know, all they did was like have half siblings and then turn into an animal and then have other children, you know, and then where do they come back in 10, you know, they would come back and, and then, uh, it's based in this, uh, part of what was then Lusitania, um, in Northwestern Spain, where my Cuban family is from. And then the hybrid section comes in when it's these fictional chapters. It's called Great Mother, because that's the uh, the name that uh, Mea Magna Mater was the name that they would chant as they would perform these rituals, these orgiastic uh, feast-based rituals that would culminate in someone uh, making themselves of a living version of Addis, this resurrected god. Um, but women were foreclosed from worshiping this great mother goddess with the same ecstatic fervor, could not hold uh, their positions within that uh, religion. And so even though the Godhead was a woman, um, which I had never been taught, right? I'd never been taught that God was a woman. I was raised in the patriarchy, like into the celestial order. So then to come into that in my thirties, like, oh my God, my ignorance, will it ever end? You know, um, and so the, the memoiristic section uh, are chapters where I, with my children uh, and my husband, sleuthing through all of these Spanish archaeological sites, trying to find the truth of this pagan cult, while simultaneously kind of unpeeling uh, the diaspora of my family and all the stories that were held frozen in time. I think almost sometimes that stories of immigrants are held back as a protective measure against the new generation, but the ramifications still echo and, and you don't know why. You know, the things happen, you don't know why. And then you learn straight, well, of course, you know, the there's that moment of, of, of catharsis that happens when something clicks into place. And so um, it kind of, the book goes between the fiction in ancient Rome um, and then the nonfiction in current day. Oh, it sounds great. <laughs> Hopefully it won't take me another 10 years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we should just do um, one more question. And this is also from our audience. Um, human nature 
being what it is, have you ever had to navigate the literary, a literary friendship that morphed into an alchemy of admiration and an unhealthy dose of envy? If so, how did you handle it? That's such an intense way to end. <laughs> a literary friendship, I'm think about this, that morphed into a, an, al an al I love this, an alchemy of admiration and an unhealthy dose of envy. How did you negotiate it? I'm ready for y'all to drop some wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to me, one of the things that I've needed to learn and that the most generous people that have been in my communities have taught me is that if there isn't space for everyone, you can make space. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that I, cause believe me, you know, all the years when it, my book wasn't getting published, I knew it was good. I, I knew it was beautiful. I mean, I knew, I knew. And, and to be told differently so many times and to watch other books, you know, get into the world that weren't nearly as crafted or intentional or thoughtful, just it's, that's life, right? But what the most generous people that I met along the way taught me is that you heal the wound by making space for others. And that's the only way to heal the wound because unfortunately it seems, I mean, for me anyways, um, we're taught like in, in this um, not enoughness in our society is so deeply ingrained in us that I don't know that it's necessarily possible to heal that in myself. You know, I don't really feel the envy, but I do feel the self-recrimination for not having done what whatever was needed to, to make it happen, you know? And so, um, so I try to ease the path for other people and in so doing, then I'm like, oh, look, space was created. See, there's space for everyone. See, see? And I teach myself that by making it happen. And then that kind of um, helps me through, essentially. That's beautiful. Um, I feel like I'm more likely to get envious of people who I'm acquaintances with than friends. And I think it's because um, I, you know, like, you know, thinking about like, you know, Kristen, like, I remember you sent me your whole spreadsheet of, you know, I think you sent me your whole spreadsheet of small presses, you know, and like, I just remember like conversations I had with you, EJ, during Jack Straw, and, you know, Paul, I sent you a story, I think, early on, and you had never, you know, we had just like, I think I like was, in, you know, at Sarah Lawrence, I had like, I was like in love with one of your students. <laughs> and so I was always hanging around. And then, <laughs> Tell me. Yeah. yeah okay. And um, and then like I think I ran into you in Ocean Grove, New Jersey at oh my, my best friend's uh, at my best friend's like antique store. And, yeah. she was looking at. and yeah. so like, but like I sent you a story and then you were like, oh, I'd like to publish this. Like I think there's just like these ways in which like um like what those friendships can actually I feel like like the way we can help each other is just so exciting. And you know, the way I ultimately was finally published by Arsenal Pulp Press was because Matilda Bernstein Sycamore told Brian Lamb about my work. And then Brian Ram Lamb read my manuscript. And I mean, and I think that was the thing that finally opened the door. I found the editor who knew how to love this book. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like I'm worried I'm taking like the politician's answer or you know, like it's not as salacious as I think the the resp the um, question asker wants, but yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Isha, <laughs> hmm. I I think I have like a perpendicular answer, like it just comes up from being asked that question. I don't think it answers that question, but I remember when I was in New York in my first poetry workshop for my MFA. Um, it, it, it was Mark Strand and he w asked us, he, <laughs> he went around the table and was like, if you were not doing poetry, what is the other thing you would be doing? And so um, he's, he said, okay, well, um, that's the thing you should do. He's like, I'm gonna save you guys some time. So why don't you work on that? <laughs> and then we went around the table to say what that other thing was. And for me, I had sort of like, 
I took a hundred thousand dollar loan and I left LA like in tears and I found this small place and started going to this program. And he got to me and I said, oh, I have nothing. He's like, you, you have nothing, I have nothing else. And I was like, no, I'm like totally alone. And he said, that's great. <laughs> he, said, he said, that's amazing because now you have nothing to fall back on. And, and I think that moment, um, it taught me not to be envious or think of anything else because it taught me that poetry is something. It's not nothing. And so I naturally um, went toward poetry in that way. And I must have been 19 or so and, and not in a good place, but that sort of spirited me. Like something changed. That's great. Thank you so much for your beautiful readings and your your thoughtful and smart and engaged answers to these questions. I hope everyone buys these writers' beautiful, beautiful books. Let's um, hold them up. Elliot Bay, yes. Um, hold them up. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. So please buy them. Take, yeah, take care of them. Um, I hope um, everyone has a lovely night. Thank you so much for spending this hour and a half with us and um, take care and be well. Mm, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. thank you, Paul. Thank you, EJ. Thank you, thank you Kristen. Thank you, Seller Artisanal Extra Seagull House. Woo thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Ellie Bay Books is doing a great job filling those orders. Ellie Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you were wonderful. Oh, Thank you. Kristen, you were too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.